Alright guys, welcome back to another video. So this is another Raised Chats video. Um, so this is a video I've been asked a lot to do. Um, and I think there's a lot of people anticipation waiting for it to come out. Um, in this one and the next one, we're going to do a part A and B and talk about batteries, solar, DC systems, wiring. I want to try and cover as much as I can going into depth enough to sort of help people but not confuse people. So we're not going to worry about algorithms and um, equations to work out wiring sizes, just really basic, simple ways to work things out. Um, so we'll cover, like I said, we'll cover batteries, AGM and lithium. We'll cover charging systems, solar and wiring. All right, and I might just touch on inverters too. So we'll start out with batteries. Um, obviously nowadays lithium batteries have entered the market. Um, they entered the market probably competitively about four, five, eight years ago. Um, we hesitated for quite a while until they really perfected lithium batteries and I could study up and find out every single thing I needed to know about them. Um, and Basically, a lot of people are still running AGM and a lot of people are thinking about going lithium. Now, sorry, itchy nose. Um, I've had numerous people ask me, is lithium worth the money? Right, now, if you've got a good AGM battery bank, just keep your AGM batteries, keep your system the way it is until they need replacing. In the event the AGMs need replacing, lithium batteries actually work out the same price if you're talking quality batteries um, so when you're talking about a hundred amp hour AGM battery now a lead battery is only good to 50% state of charge right so a 100 amp hour AGM battery is only actually usable of 50 amp hours now say you buy a good AGM battery you're looking at five to six hundred bucks so to get 100 amp hours, you're going to need two of those. So as you're looking at between 1,000 and 1,200 bucks for decent AGM batteries. Now, I know Enerdrive often have sales um, and you can get 100 amp hour lithium for $1,000. So in that respect with lithium, your 100 amp hours is usable 100 amp hours. You can use every single hour of that 100 amp hours. So for $1,000, you're actually getting 100 amp hours and the battery is a quarter of the weight. So you're getting weight reduction, and you're actually getting it cheaper if you look at the, the grand scheme of it. Um, lithium batteries charge a hell of a lot quicker. We're not going to go into percentages, um, but they charge a hell of a lot quicker. They last a lot longer. So a lithium battery will have an average of 8,000 cycles in it, and then they'll drop 10% of their life. So if it's a 200 amp hour battery, after 8,000 cycles of 10 years, it'll drop to 180. Is that right? 10%. Yeah, 180 amp hour battery. So an AGM battery usually has about four to 500 cycles in it, and then they're basically RS. So in the respect of all that, lithium does come out on top. There's pretty well no downsides to lithium unless you buy cheap. If you buy cheap lithium, that's where they're getting a bad name and people are saying they don't last, they don't hold charge. Um, they don't handle corrugations and that is all to do with cheap lithium batteries guys make sure you look into it talk to your suppliers unless you can talk to the people who make the battery don't buy the battery you need to know everything about it. what kind of cells they are make sure they're a pasmatic cell or similar just to know that that battery is going to be made to quality um, as for draining your battery a lithium does drain slower the draw rate is a lot slower um, so once you go AGM to lithium, we notice the difference just instantly um, in draw rate, recharge rate, and obviously weight and size. Um, it was just, it was incredible. So that's basically just all I really want to touch on with lithium and AGM. Um, and everything I'm saying in this video, I'm not reading anything off a brochure. Um, there's, I've got nothing written down. Everything is in my head. Every bit of information I'm going to give you guys is first-hand information that I've proven to a lot of people and systems I have done that are now flawless and working systems um, that have been improved upon systems that people have had that don't work. So I'm not going to sit here and spiel on about 
all the statistics in a brochure. I'm just going to tell you what we've got, what I've seen over the years, and what works. That's the main thing, is what works. So we just touched on batteries there. Um, like I said, with batteries, it, for brands, just, if it's 700 bucks, walk past it. It's, like I said, unless you can talk to the manufacturer, don't buy it. And you want all the specs on it, and you can find most specs you want online anyway. So, suppose we go from battery to wiring. Makes sense, you reckon? Yeah, cool. Might as well. <laughs> all right, so wiring. Now, this is a thing I've seen firsthand, guys, and it's the biggest, one of the biggest downfalls in people's DC systems is they think it doesn't work, and it all comes down to your wiring. Now, I'll just take his over because we've got all the wiring on the ground here out of the canopy of the Jeep. Um, so basically, just put me back to the camera. Somewhere here, which one of these is it? That one? Yep. So you've got eight mil wire. I know that doesn't really show. Eight mil wire. Somewhere here, there'll be six mil. Can you see the six mil? Um, there? Yes. So that's a piece of, no, that's dual core. Yeah, no. There, piece of six mil wire. Now, everywhere you go will be different. Some will be six mil, some will be gauge, some will be BNS. But it's all basically convertible. And then you've got your big battery lead, right? So they're your three main sizes. Now, when it comes to wiring your DC DC, most DC DC these days you're looking at 48. God, that wind, we'll just get out of the wind. Um, DC DCs, you're looking at 40 amp charges and they usually run over a few meters. So eight mil wiring is the minimum you wanna go on a charger, minimum. So if you've got your DC-DC in your van and you're charging that, powering that from your alternator, obviously, you might wanna run 10 mil wire from your alternator to your rear bar of your car, and then eight mil from there to your charger, or you will suffer big voltage drop. We were actually in Camel Wheel. Was it Camel Wheel? Yes, it was. Yeah. And I helped, it was an awesome old bloke. Um, he'd fitted his charger himself, which was awesome. But he had actually run six mil dual core from his battery all the way back to the Anadrive DC-DC in his van. So the alternator was easily capable of putting out that 50 amps the charger required. But due to using six mil wire, by the time that got, you know, 12 meters back to his DC-DC, that wire was only capable of carrying 10 amps. And He'd had the charger installed for a couple of months and then couldn't work out why his batteries were always flat. Um, you've got to pitch your wiring as like a straw. You know, if you've got a straw and you're blowing through it, it'll blow nice and free. Yeah. Right, sorry about that, guys. Just had a parcel truck come up. But yeah, so you've got a straw blowing through it, blows through very easily. Now, if you get your fingers, start crushing, crushing that straw, it gets harder and harder to blow the air, right? Exactly the same with wiring. So you've got 50 amps pumping into a small wire at the front. By the time that gets to 12 meters down the track, there's bugger all left. That's what we call voltage drop. Very common. Most people, when they think they're having power issues with fridges, it's due to too small a wiring. Too big is better than too small. So we use six mil wiring for all fridge wiring, Basically everything, unless it's a light, lights we use like three mil, but fridges, um, what else, you know, water pumps, we use six mil for everything, eight mil for all the charging gear, and 10 mil feeds the power supply, so where the charges, everything run and charge from, so the main buzz bars. Um, with wiring, tape, throw it in the bin, always use heat shrink, very important. And I know crimp on fittings are easy and they're cheap and anyone can do it. I know that, that's why it's on the market. But guys, it doesn't last, okay? I've proven to so many people, even if with your big, um, your big metal eyelets, people have hydraulic crimpers. Now I've proven that you can still pull the wire out of there. Unless it's sealed, moisture gets in there, moisture causes corrosion, corrosion causes continuity issues. So you're not gonna actually get contact in there, which causes problems. Now looking at the wire, you might think it's fine, but if it's got contact issues inside, you're gonna be seeing that elsewhere in the van and you're, it's gonna be a nightmare to find it. So solder, 
solder, solder. Fill your eyelets, flooded solder all your eyelets, solder everything and heat shrink everything. That way you can rule out your connections. Bigger wire than you think, so you can always rule out voltage drop. Um, I think that's about it. And make sure you use right colours. I know that sounds stupid, but I have worked on systems where they've just used black wire for everything because it hides nice. Or they've used red wire because they brought a big roller single core. And it's all right when you do it and it's simple, but even if you have to go back and work on it down the track, it becomes a headache because you've got to test every single wire. You can't actually trace anything. Um, so that sort of covers wiring. Um, same righto, same along with wiring, fuses, every single thing you put in your van, in your car, whatever it is, your boat, fuse it. Whether you buy a fuse box and fuse every single item, whether it's negative fused or positive fused, make sure it's fused or get auto resetting circuit breakers um, with your charges and everything, run resettable circuit breakers, not auto reset, make sure they're resettable circuit breakers and they're the good quality, big resettable breakers. Um, you don't want an auto reset breaker on a charger because if a charger shorts out somewhere because of wire chafes, you don't want that to keep cutting through. You just want it to cut the power. Um, so that sort of touches a bit on wiring. I think it touches on it enough anyway. If anyone's got any questions, you just can just shoot them through. Um, like I said, I've got no plans for this, so I could ramble, I could go back, I could skip things. So we'll see how we go. Um, and then moving on to charges. So if you've got lithium or you're going lithium, make sure you look into your charges and make sure they're lithium compatible. If they're not, you'll have to change them. Um, all your seven stage, I'm probably gonna get haters for this, but all your six stage, seven stage charges, it's all sales pitch. Um, you only really need three stages, bulk absorption float. That's all you need. You don't need none of the other stuff. Um, so as everyone knows now, we run Anadrive gear. I have no affiliation with them, but I've converted quite a few people's systems now to Anadrive and they all swear by it now and basically think it's the best thing they've ever done. Uh, there is other systems on the market, but Anadrive keep it simple. There's always the KISS scenario, you know, keep it simple, stupid, and Anadrive do that. Um, I'm not a believer in the big one system that does solar, DC, DC, your inverter and charge. I don't like that um, because if one unit fails, the whole system needs replacing. So I like things separate. You can indiv individually monitor things. It's just a lot simpler. It might look as pretty, but it is a lot simpler and a lot more manageable. Um, so DC, DCs, like I said, we run the Anadrive DC, DC, DC 40 plus, and it's also a solar regulator up to 40 amps and 800 watts of solar. Now, that has been flawless. We've got one in the car and one in the van. The one in the van, we haven't actually hooked up the DC-DC side of it. It's all wired, but we've never had to use it because we fully rely on the solar in it. Um, the car does run both. Now, if you do a lot of short distance driving, um, say you're doing, you know, 50 Ks a travel day, sort of 100 Ks a travel day, you might want to look at having a solar regulator and a DC-DC because a DC-DC will put in alternator current or solar current, whereas if you're running an individual charger, you can pump in, say you're putting in 40 from your DC-DC and your solar can put in 30. You'd be putting in, what, 60 amps, you can be pumping in 70 amps. God, my mass is shit. You can be pumping in 70 amps for that 50K drive as opposed to just the 40 from your alternator. So it's it all comes into what you're doing and how you're traveling, but like I said, shoot us a message if you've got any questions. Um, so solar regulators are another big thing. You can get, you know, $50 regulators off eBay. You know, we've been there, done it, when we started out and thought they were gonna be awesome, but the fact of the matter is, on eBay, if it says MPPT, it's probably PWN. So you always want MPPT chargers, and to get an MPPT charger, you're probably looking at like 300 bucks minimum. If it's cheaper than that, there's a chance it's not actually MPPT. So you do get what you pay for when it comes to that sort of stuff. Um, like I said, DC-DC, a good three-stage charger that you can set your own algorithm you know, if you want to, but most of them have got good good um, settings in them anyway. 
Uh, with the Anadrive, you can go up to 50 amps and down to 10 amps. You can set your charge rates, whatever you want. 240 charges, exactly the same. Um, you, you want like a 40 amp charger as a minimum. Like I know you can get 15 amp, 20 amp charges, but the fact of the matter, they take forever. Most of the time you just want to be able to charge your battery up, get it done and get on your way again. Um, same thing if you've got lithium, make sure that charger is lithium compatible. So I'll just, while I've actually got them out of the car, I'll give you a look at the Anadrive chargers. Just seeing as though that's what I like to recommend. And that's what we have fitted to all the systems I do. That's what I fit. So that's the Anadrive AC charger there. Um, they all have temperature gauges. They're nice big um, terminals to put all your wiring on. So that's your 240 charger. They've got two thermo fans in the top. So they're all fan co air cooled. Very, very effective chargers. Um, you're looking at I think the AC ones are around the 600, 650. Obviously, you can get them on sale. And then that's the DC DC. So they look exactly the same. The DC DC is a little smaller. It still has the same terminals in the bottom. Individual positive and negative for your battery, individual positive and negative for your house battery, and then individual positive and negative for your solar, plus the temperature sensor. That way you can always get accurate monitoring. All right, let's down again. All this walking back and forth thing. I'm just actually touching on the wiring that I was talking about before. Um, wiring doesn't, too small a wiring doesn't only cause voltage drop. Um, it can cause fires due to too much current running through the wire. Wire gets hot and starts melting, which has happened a lot. So wire choice, make sure when you look at your wiring, it can handle the amperage over the distance. Um, so like six mil wire will handle 50 amps, but it might only be to a meter. So just really important guys, really important looking at this stuff. I know 12 volts, people go, oh, it's 12 volt system, it's easy, but there's still a lot more in depth. Like it's just cause it's 12 volt doesn't mean it's not dangerous. Um, right, so that sort of touches on batteries and wiring and fuses. Um, with, with your fuses, with switches, make sure your switches can also handle the current you're putting through them. Otherwise they can melt and you can get voltage drop through your switches for your fridges and that sort of stuff. But I don't want to drag out too far. Uh, I don't want people to get overwhelmed and bored. So we'll call that the end of this one, part one. I'll do part two next Saturday. So keep an eye out for that. Don't forget to like the video if you like it, subscribe to the channel. Um, we've got plenty more little race chats and we've got our travel videos. There's a lot, a lot, so more we can do to keep everyone interested, the better, more we can show and teach people. But yeah, so Tune in next Saturday for part two. We'll go into solar and inverters and um, give you a real good look at how I've wired the van and take you through all that next week. So tune in next Saturday. I'll see you then.